As you find your way back to your seat, I'm going to invite you to open up your scriptures right away. Uh, the address is here on the screen, 1 Thessalonians uh, uh, chapter 5. That's page 1188 if you're using the live paperback. And we're also going to spend some time in Psalm 105 today, which is page 600 in the live paperback. So find those two places, especially if you like to take notes. If you just like to sit and soak in the presence of those words, they'll all be on the screens. Some of the words we're just going to read out loud and let them hit our ears. Some of them we're going to look at a little deeper, and so they'll be on the screen so they can move through our eyes into our heart. And uh, I'm just excited about, about today's service uh, because it's like we said, it's Thanksgiving week, but I love the opportunity to just not think about all those other things, to not think about logistics and strategies and all the things that we have to do for work, but just to pause and let my heart be quiet around the idea of what, what am I thankful for? What does it mean to have that posture? So that's what this is all about. We're going to jump in at uh, 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, so have your scriptures ready there, and as you find that place, uh, this is a letter from Paul to the church, and um, he had heard from Timothy, who went as an emissary ahead of, his, ahead of him to find out how the church was doing, and he heard from Timothy that the believers there had remained faithful even though there was great opposition. That when they would become believers of Jesus and their faith practices and their faith platform would change, there was a lot of persecution and they were standing up in the middle of that. So he writes this letter to them to encourage them to live a life worthy of their calling, to stay in. And, uh, and then he gave them this hope because we know that believers are going to see Jesus. On the day that he returns, we're all going to see him again, so how do we live between this day and that day? And so it's a good letter for all of us to pay attention to. So um, the opening passage today is going to be from 1 Thessalonians 5, but let's ask God's blessing first. Pray with me. Father God, as we quiet ourselves before you, as we open your word, I pray that you will open our hearts to be hearers. For Jesus, you said that he who has ears, let him hear, and so um, help us with that. Help us to have the heart that is the good soil, where the word of God lands in that place and produces a harvest of righteousness. Tenfold, a hundredfold, a thousand. Father, may, may those branches um, become a sanctuary for people to know you. May the way that we live uh, shine the light for your glory on you. And so help us in this moment, even this morning, uh, to nurture uh, the part of our heart that is gratitude. And uh, so I pray today that as your word does its work to accomplish your purposes in our lives and in your communities, uh, Father, that in the places that you have placed us, help us to be light bearers, to be bringers of truth and bringers of life. So help me this morning to be a good teacher. Help all of us to be students of the word. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, the opening passage for today. Uh, we don't often uh, talk back in worship, except those little dialogue things, but we don't uh, recite the Heidelberg Catechism much or read scripture together out loud. But this is such a short passage this morning. I'm going to have you repeat after me, all right? Almost like uh, vows or something like that. So all the words will be on the screen. This is 1 Thessalonians 5, 16 to 18. I'll give it to you just a couple of words at a time, and you shout it back, all right? Here we go. Rejoice always. Pray continually. Pray continually. Give, thanks in all circumstances. Give thanks in all circumstances. For this is God's will for you in Christ Jesus. Word of the Lord. Yep. I love it. I love I remember back in the old days when dinosaurs and station wagons were on the face of the earth and we, all, that we used to put our knee down from the pew in front of us and pull up the scripture. Remember that? And it said, Holy Bible on the front there, yeah, and we would open it, and everybody would turn to page 1188 at the same time. Do you remember the sound of those pages? Oh, that was a sweet sound for me, and you know my favorite sounds. I've been talking to you about those for years, um, whether it's impact sprinklers, the sound of Cheryl's voice, or, <laughs> or the turning of the pages of Scripture all at the same time. Maybe I should add to that list the sound of God's children speaking his word out loud. There's some sweetness in speaking God's word. Can I get an amen? And today we're reminded that we should rejoice always and pray continually. 
and give thanks in all circumstances. And if, if I had a whiteboard up here, and I don't know why I don't have a whiteboard up here, I would draw a line on this end of the whiteboard. It'd be a four by eight sheet, by the way. And all the way over here, I'd draw another dot on the whiteboard with a big line in between. And on this spectrum are all circumstances. And you can imagine, you're probably today, if I had each of you come up here and I gave you a, um, one of those uh, dry erase pens and you put a dot on the line of where you are on in all circumstances, I wonder, I bet we're not all in the same place, right? I wonder if everybody would be somewhere in all circumstances. So I wondered about that, especially over these past few weeks when I was meditating on 1 Thessalonians 5. And I thought about those words always, continually, in all circumstances, and I had a one-word response. Really? Really, is this what God is calling us to? I mean, the text says it is God's will for us in Christ Jesus, for us to give thanks in all circumstances. All. That's a hard call, isn't it? I mean, let's be honest with ourselves. It's a hard call because sometimes we're overwhelmed by circumstances. It's a hard call to become aware of God's goodness and presence every day, regardless of what's going on. Regardless of whether you have a tiny house in the burbs or a lake house. Where, regardless of your financial income or your frantic outcomes. Regardless if all your plans come together or if life seems to be coming apart. To be thankful in all circumstances. The point is, and I think this is a testimony about our culture, is we can be tempted to feel that life is good only when it is. When it's easy, when it's comfortable, that's the day I want to wear that t-shirt or have that coffee cup. You know, life is good. You know that statement. You've seen it. Can life also be good when it's difficult, when it's hard, when there's pain and disappointment, when you feel abandoned, or when most of your memories, when they come back to you, it hurts because there's pain? So I wondered about the, the Christians in, in um, Thessalonica where Paul was writing, and here they were, new believers, and they were standing up in the middle of persecution. How did the Christians there remain faithful? How, how did they stand up in that? How did they handle the persecution and abuse and abandonment that once they would become a believer, um, those who weren't would say, you're out. I can't be a part of your life anymore. And maybe there's a lesson in here for me. Maybe it's not about improving my life. Maybe it's not about avoiding conflict or buckling under the bullies in my life, and most of them live in my memory. I don't get bullied so much anymore. But man, as a junior high kid, I don't know any of you. <laughs> uh, so I had a problem when I was in junior high. I was very tall and handsome and smart. <laughs> it's my story. Hang on. And some of my peers weren't, and they took offense. <laughs> That's not how it was. Can I tell you a funny story? <laughs> Sorry, this isn't in the script, so just hang on. Carrie Clark's looking at me like, come on, Terry, you know? Um, George is his name. I won't tell you his last name. Uh, Flatman. And um, uh, I was pretty fast as a junior high kid. I have ribbons and trophies to prove that. Um, and George was a great ahead of me, and he, uh, he would bully me all the time. And uh, I remember one time he was chasing me, and I was fast. I was pretty fast, and I found some wet grass. <laughs> Down I went. And he was sitting on top of me and grabbed a worm out of that wet grass and held it above my face and then pushed me down so I had to open my mouth, and he was going to drop it. And he goes, are you afraid? And I said, I am of your face. <laughs> This is what causes George to hit people. <laughs> Being in my 60s, it's easier to have a little fun with some of those memories, uh, but in the day there was a lot of anxiety. Maybe the day, uh, your memories, and when we talk about, let's remember the good things, and then those other memories come up with it, come on, and it's hard. And I don't know why it is, but I think it's something that happened in the Garden of Eden. When we sinned, somehow our minds switched. Something broke in there. And now the memories that we remember most easy are the bad ones. Can I get an amen? 
Why is it? I don't know. But I know there, are, there will be a day when there will be no more tears, even about those things. Back to the script. Maybe what Paul was teaching his church, we can learn in our church today. To choose our outlook on life to choose what we focus on, because we know we live in a broken world. We know that there's sin in my heart and in the hearts of everyone who walks on the face of the planet. We know that there are schemes of the devil to steal and kill and destroy, to destroy the children of God because he can't destroy Jesus. Read it in the book of the Revelation. But imagine if I choose to look for God's hand in my life and his works in the lives of those people around me. Imagine if I choose that or to strive to discover his presence and his goodness even in the fire and the flood. And we sing that really well, but it's hard to live it. What if I choose to increase my gratitude quotient so that I can give thanks no matter what, in the famine and in the bountiful seasons, on the days when it all works out and on the days when nothing seems to work? This is a confession. It's easy to be a pastor in other people's trouble. I've been in those places. I've been called to people's houses and it's easier to help someone to hold their spiritual hands and help them walk through that than it is when that trouble is at my door. Does that make sense? Say yes if it does. I can be in the hospital room with a family when the family member is being translated into glory and I can help them walk through that. And there's something that God gives a pastor, I think, and maybe other people too, probably other people too, to somehow have this blessed insulation to keep it together, even in the most difficult places. And I've been there. I've held hands singing hymns with people who are translated. I've been in those places. But then it happens in your own life. <laughs> and God, How do I handle that? Sometimes I still weep when I I think about the memories of my dad. Sometimes all those other pains, they come up and there's an ache in there. I think it's a blessing to be able to do that. But I know that uh, even in my future days, I'll have to figure out how to deal with my own grief and how to always not be a late griever, but to handle it in the moment to be better equipped to handle the brokenness of life because I understand that God is good and I can thank him in all circumstances. Amen? If it's easier to be a pastor in someone else's, by someone else's deathbed and help them trust Jesus, even in the valley of the shadows of death, maybe I can learn to handle that when it comes to my own table. When we hear a cancer diagnosis for the first time. I've been with people to help them process that. When it came to us about our daughter, it was harder. Or when your 401 is not okay. Anybody else lose 20, 25% of their value recently? Yeah. So I'm gonna be working for 18 more years, praise the Lord. <laughs> the word calls us to gratitude in all circumstances because it's God's will for us in Christ Jesus. When we nurture a heart and a posture of thankfulness, there will automatically, maybe not automatically, with some nurture, with some work, there will actually be less complaining. I think complaining blinds us to God's goodness. It makes me focus on something else, amen? Does that make sense? I take my eyes off of what God is doing in my life and in the lives of those around me and I begin to focus on the brokenness and the ache and the loss and the grief and the pain. And instead, imagine instead, I can begin when I focus on God and I nurture a thankful heart, I can begin to experience peace and patience and I can trust God in the feast and in the famine. There may still be things that we could complain about. Life is hard, I get it but we can learn to pay less attention to the pain so it won't hurt so much. We believe that God is our comforter and our help. We believe from the scripture that we can look to him to help us, that he gave us the the spirit who is the paraclete, the parakletos, the one who walks with us in those things no matter what. But if we only focus on that brokenness, on the loss, on the pain, we won't see him. 
I'm convinced that thankfulness is the antidote to complaining. Complaining and blaming, however, is our native tongue. 25% of the world's population died right after a worship service. You can read it in the book of Genesis, where after worship, one brother killed the other, complaining that his sacrifice wasn't acceptable, where he didn't have gratitude in his heart. It's an amazing thing. Our native, the native tongue in our culture is complaining. Um, gratitude for us is more like ESL. It's more like a second language that we have to learn. We need to nurture that thing so it becomes our primary language so that it overwhelms our thoughts about uh, what we think. Because if we focus on what we're missing out on or what we think we deserve or, or even the thoughts about what we have that we don't deserve, you know, I mean, how many times have you heard it? It's not my fault, it's your fault, so I'm going to blame somebody, right? It's an attitude or a posture. But when we nurture gratitude that looks like thanksgiving, all those other things begin to fade. If we let the attitude of dissatisfaction and complaining take over our lives, you know the fruit that grows on those branches? On the branches of that weed? Jealousness. Covetousness, anger, anger for others or at others because of their blessings. Why did they get that? I worked harder. And pretty soon we want to take their stuff. And if they get in the way of us taking their stuff, we harm them. Sounds a little bit like the Ten Commandments played out in the story, isn't it? It is. It's not hard to see how much sin thankfulness can actually push away. That when uh, a spirit of thanksgiving overwhelms all those other things, it becomes the antidote for complaining, and it begins to push away the fruit of envy and strife and stealing and all sorts of hatred and sadness. Let's look at the context again, the verses just before our text today. This is 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 12. The words are on the screen. So Paul's writing them, listen for, he's saying, there are leaders among you, and they're going to lead you in these things. And because you're being led in developing this heart, you can have a heart of gratitude. Here's how he says it. Now we ask you, brothers and sisters, to acknowledge those who work hard among you, who care for you in the Lord, and who admonish you. That's to keep you in, right? To, to give you some hedges, or uh, it's like the bumpers at the bowling alley, right? Uh, the, it, that way, it's always going to go down the lane. Those who admonish you, hold them in the highest regard, in love because of their work. Live in peace with each other. And we urge you, brothers and sisters, warn those who are idle and disruptive, encourage the disheartened, help the weak, and be patient with everyone. Make sure that nobody pays back wrong for wrong, but always strive to do what is good for each other and everyone else. In those verses, Paul is teaching the church about the role and responsibility of church leaders, those who labor among us, who direct us and lead us, sometimes admonishing us for how we think and behave. Through their leadership and encouragement, we learn to live in peace. The lazy are put to work, the disruptive are calmed down, and the disheartened are lifted up and encouraged. And when we start living with a heart of gratitude, we can begin to see ways to be thankful to see the bounty of blessing in our own lives and, and to help us to nurture benevolent generosity, to live in ways that benefit others instead of benefiting ourselves. Look the way he says it. He says, encourage those who are struggling, help those who are weak, be patient with everybody because everybody has stuff. Begin to think of your own abundance so that you nurture a heart of generosity to bless others. Things like unity and joy and satisfaction and happiness start to fill our hearts. And when, we, when those are there, we look for ways to bless others because we don't feel like we're giving out of scarcity, but we're giving out of generosity. We start to hold our stuff more loosely, and we start to forget about what we were complaining about. One psychologist said that in meeting the needs of others, 80% of our own needs are met. And I think they were right. That's the context for our text today. Becoming a healthy body, a healthy faith community, functioning well together because we have good leaders who follow Jesus and we can follow them in knowing and living like Jesus. 
and the thing in us that makes our relationships either work or not work is, listen, the condition of our heart to be filled with gratitude. You see, gratitude is a tangible response to the abundance of God that is ours. He's filled us with his goodness and his glory. And out of that rich reservoir, we bless others. Listen to those same words again now from our text, knowing that this is our call. We have leaders who help us call, who call that out of us to, to bless others in the way that we live. Here are those same words again. Paul chose the words to describe our posture. Rejoice always. The word rejoice is it's a positive word. It's a positive posture. It means to look forward to the opportunity in every circumstance. Imagine that, that no matter where you find yourself on that spectrum, no matter where you drew your, your dot or put a check mark on that line of all circumstances, imagine the posture of looking for the opportunity that in this place, even in the place of hardship, what is God's purpose? How can I be thankful that he's with me? The scripture says pray continually. That's a posture, a posture of humility, of asking God for his perspective in everything. What does it look like for each of us that even when we're in trouble, even when our heart aches so much, it's like a glass jar dropped on a hard tile floor and it's, it's a million pieces. Some of it went under the appliances. Some of it we can't find. To be humble. To say, God... How do you see this? What, what is your purpose in my life? And maybe it's simply to experience your presence and your healing. And in verse 18, Paul says, give thanks in all circumstances. That's a posture of gratitude to know that God is with you in every situation and he will see you through everything for his purposes. We believe that he's working out all things for our good. For those who are in Christ Jesus, called to look like him, to become more like him. We know those scriptures from Romans 8. Imagine saying, God, I'm, I'm thankful that you're with me in this. I know you have a purpose for my life. I want to know that in my heart. And I want to be able to help others discover it too. This is God's will for you in Christ Jesus. Today, maybe you know someone who's going to have a hard Thanksgiving week someone who suffers. And sometimes in those places, we lose a sense of gratitude. Or maybe you know someone who's just bent that way. That's their inclination, and they suffer from a lack of gratitude. They're not joyful, they're not humble in prayer, and complaining is the one record they have in their record collection, and it's a single, it's a 45, and they have a portable record player, and they'll play that record for you every time they see you. We all have someone in our life like that. Maybe they're going to be at your dinner table this week on Thanksgiving Day. Maybe you're not too excited about seeing them. But imagine knowing this scripture, that the way I live affects them, that out of the blessedness in my life, I can be generous and encourage them. Maybe this helps us see the gold, the opportunity in every circumstance, the value in a heart conditioned by gratitude. Because a person with thankful heart is like a lamp in a dark room. They bring joy into your life. They pray for you in ways that make you feel closer to God himself. And they pay attention to you with grace and kindness. That's the thankful heart. To people like that, we are, actually I wrote that sentence three times. It sounded like Yoda to me. To people like that, we are. <laughs> I got to raise my voice. To people like that, we are. There we go. There it is. So did you know that the word yada is um, wisdom or knowledge? And then this is Yoda, and he's supposed to be the smart one in that movie series? I don't know. Maybe somebody thought of that. To people like that who are full of thankfulness and gratitude, we're attracted. We're drawn into them. Actually, we kind of want to be like them because they help us see that God is good all the time in every circumstance, even when the time isn't good. Together, 
we can learn to foster a heart of gratitude so that rejoicing and thankfulness aren't just for the holidays, they're for every day. We can learn from the psalmist who describes the heart of thankfulness in very easy language, and this is how we'll end, Psalm 105. I invite you to turn there, page 600 in the paperback. Listen for the outward focus as he describes this heart of thankfulness. Listen for how the heart of thankfulness sings when gratitude becomes a catalyst for our language. Out of the heart, out of a full heart, we worship. Psalm 105, verses 1 to 6. Give praise to the Lord. Proclaim his name. Make known among the nations what he has done. Sing to him, sing praises to him, and tell of all his wonderful acts. Glory in his holy name, and let the hearts of those who seek the Lord rejoice. Look to the Lord and his strength. Seek his face always. Remember the wonders he has done, his miracles, and even the judgments he has pronounced. You, his servants, the descendants of Abraham, his chosen ones, the children of Jacob, This is a psalm about telling everyone, about retelling the stories to anyone about God's covenant faithfulness, to shine the light on him, to make him known everywhere, to describe his goodness in words that others understand, all with a thankful heart that's already satisfied knowing that he is everything that we need. The scripture describes him as our portion and our inheritance. That causes gladness in my heart. One of those Hebrew words means out of a merry heart. That's when you know that the goodness of God has begun to overwhelm your circumstances. When there's some light and life and you can feel the smile start to grow on your heart again. Thankfulness lifts up our countenance and the lives of those around us. We believe, like the psalmist, that no matter the circumstances, God is always good. God is always at work in our lives for our good. And if you read the rest of Psalm 105 105 today, you'll see they're retelling the story about when he took them out of slavery. He took us out of slavery to sin. He led them into the promised land like he's leading us into all his promises, even when, and especially when, it doesn't feel like we're enough even when it doesn't feel like he's enough. So today, let's commit to train ourselves to remember, to focus on him, even when there's so much clutter demanding our attention, we can't hear his voice. It takes time to learn to be patient in his presence. It takes time to quiet our hearts and minds and to let the memories and the stories of his goodness rise up again to the forefront of our minds because sometimes they have to come all the way back from the storage room in that dark corner in the storage room because we haven't told his story in a long time. Let that memory become loud, to become loud enough to quiet all the other noises in your mind. And maybe that's why God ordained pilgrimages in the Old Testament, festivals for his people to go up to the city, to get away from all the duties of life, to get into his presence together, and together to retell the stories, to retrain our hearts, to remember his goodness of all his works, to be thankful always. And maybe that's why we have this week, this week of Thanksgiving where we get to gather again and remember the goodness that he has poured into our lives all the good things that he's done for us, to remind us to tell of his goodness and to remember together that when our posture is humble and our hearts are full of gratitude, we become more thankful. Read Psalm 105 today. It'll say words like they remembered when they were nothing but a small nation, wandering in the desert in the foreign lands and God protected them. They recalled how in the famine, God sent Joseph ahead to prepare a storehouse of food and to give them a land to live in. That what they had planned for evil, God had meant for good, is Joseph's testimony. And it wasn't for the sake of Egypt. It was for the sake of God's people. So they celebrated the gifts of leadership, of Joseph, of Moses, to lead them out of Egypt, that God saved them from all the plagues, and he blessed them in the Passover that they, that they might not experience death. He led them in the desert with fire and a cloud. He gave them bread from heaven and water from a rock, and they gathered together to tell those stories. It ends this way. I'll just read the end for you. It's on the screen, Psalm 105, verse 42. For he remembered his holy promises given to his servant Abraham. He brought out his people with rejoicing, his chosen one with shouts of joy. He gave them the lands of the nations, and they fell heir to what others had toiled for. 
that they might keep his precepts and observe his laws. Praise the Lord. Maybe, like me, you have never been a slave in Egypt. Maybe you have never had manna from the sky out in the desert. But all of us have been set free. My sin and my guilt are now covered by the blood of the Lamb. This is my testimony. No longer am I a slave to the master of sin. I have the Holy Spirit residing in my heart so I can live for God. And on the days that I don't, for those times that I mess up, I have his promises, his eternal and unfailing goodness to forgive me and purify me and free me from all unrighteousness. And when I'm sad or depressed or in despair or confused or afraid, I have a resident teacher that I can call on, the comforter, the Holy Spirit, who resides in my heart closer than a friend. He's always with me, and I'm never alone. And you know I have anxiety issues, but my anxiety is getting less. My trust issues are becoming, well, less of an issue. My joy is becoming full again, and thank you for praying with me this whole year for the joy of the Lord to return. And you know what? You're part of the answer. Because the fellowship of alive is sweet. The joy and worship you can taste. And it overwhelms my heart. My times of scripture every morning with Cheryl as we read and pray together before we begin our day sets our feet in the right direction. And every day I have health and resources. Life is good because God is good all the time. Man, I have more. Let's just jump right to the prayer. And uh, um, I just want to invite you. I have the opportunity to stand here and give you my testimony. You have the opportunity on Wednesday to give yours. I want that for you. We can learn the language of thanksgiving. We can. And shine the light on God and be full of joy or we can get stuck in complaining, our own or someone else's. But I want you to know I choose gratitude. I choose joy. I choose peace. I don't want anything to do with complaining. I don't have the time. So let's get busy talking about the goodness of God. Amen? Pray with me. God, your glory makes the stars shine and it makes my heart sing. To you, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, belongs all praise and glory now and forevermore. We've been redeemed and saved by the blood of the Lamb. We've been made new and have become a part of the family of God by the Holy Spirit who dwells in us. And we have the promises of God and the hope of eternal life. And on that day, we will worship you without any hindrance, without becoming tired, and we will delight in your presence. So until that day, bless our heaven practice like this morning. Give us a spirit of worship to lift our hearts, to lift our hands and our voices. Strengthen us for the mission of making you famous and keep us for the day of the Lord. And as you have accepted us because of Jesus, accept this prayer in Jesus' name.